Welcome to the Great Traits Project podcast. We investigate the character traits that drive great achievements and reveal the mindset behind success. Throughout these podcasts, we introduce you to remarkable individuals from the world of sports, business, the military, the arts, science and technology, groundbreaking explorers, and many more. We shed light on how they behave and what they believe, and we discuss their attitude to life. On the 3rd of November 2016, we will release our book, which is called Great Traits. The book reveals the five character traits that make successful people tick, and it can be found on Amazon by searching for Great Traits, which is spelled G-R-E-A-T, and then Traits, T-R-A-I-T-S, or search for the author's name, Tobias Harwood, which is spelled T-O-B-I-A-S, and then Harwood, spelled H-A-R-W-O-O-D. All the author's proceeds from the sale of the book are donated to the charity Walking with the Wounded. The reason why is explained in the opening chapter of the book. On this month's podcast, we meet Roz Savage, an ocean rower, author and speaker. She's the first woman to row solo across the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Oceans. She's rowed over 15,000 miles solo. She's taken around 5 million oar strokes and spent cumulatively over 500 days of her life at sea in a 23-foot rowing boat. Every podcast begins with the guests summarising their most significant life events in less than two minutes. And with that, I give you Roz Savage. My life started out pretty conventionally, Um, did a law degree at Oxford, 11 years management consultant. And then in my early 30s, I decided to throw all of the cards up in the air and went through quite a major personal reinvention, gave up the sensible job and the salary check and the home and inspired by an environmental epiphany, I set out to row solo across uh, the three biggest oceans in the world, the Atlantic, the Pacific and the Indian, and to use that as my platform to raise awareness and hopefully inspire action on our environmental challenges. Brilliant. Perfect summary. And um, I suppose maybe the best place to start is just to um, talk about, as you mentioned there, your sort of uh, quite conventional, modest family upbringing, and then how... um, at a certain point in your life, you you became a little bit distracted by materialism or, or Ooh, even seduced dis- by materialism. <laughs> seduced is a good word for it. Um, yeah, my parents are both Methodist preachers, which isn't really something that you go into to make uh, your fame and fortune. And um, when we were 16, my dad went on a work exchange to Southern California, to San Diego, And I was at a very formative age and I was just blown away by that American lifestyle. These amazing houses with swimming pools and multiple bathrooms. And I was pretty fed up with never having any money. So I decided that I wanted to have the money in the big house. And I thought that all of these things would make me happy. So yes, that's what I spent the next 15 years or so of my life pursuing my version of the American dream. And to a certain extent, it, it played out in one sense. Is, is that a fair comment in that you ended up with a very nice house, a very nice I job, did, yeah. very nice car? I was, I was very lucky. And I know that this sounds incredibly spoiled and definitely a first world problem. But I, I did get all of those trappings of the yuppie lifestyle. Um, but the weird thing was that it didn't actually make me happy. And it took me a long time to admit that to myself, because when you've spent that big a chunk of your life pursuing a particular dream, it's actually quite embarrassing and quite difficult to admit to yourself that you were completely wrong. And I think the problem was that I'd, I was looking to things outside of myself to make me happy. And it's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true that really happiness has to come from inside you. And no matter how big your house is or how nice your car is, if you're not happy inside of yourself with the person that you are, then anything external isn't going to fix that. And so it was a bit of a an existential crisis for me, really. It's like if all of this materialism isn't making me happy, then yikes, I've got to find something else. And I think this might be harder work to find to find the answer to this question of, of what's really going to work and what I really want to do when I grow up. You, you mentioned in your 
book that there was a kind of really, I think, a tipping point where you were stuffed under the arm of someone in a commuter train and you caught the eye of an obituary in, in the newspaper over their shoulder and that led to a very interesting exercise. That's right. Um, it was when I was going through this existential crisis and trying to figure out, well, if all of this stuff isn't going to make me happy, then what is? And um, so I was, I was inspired to write two versions of my own obituary, the one that I wanted and the one that I was actually heading for if I carried on as I was living my life at that time. And when I wrote the fantasy obituary, it wasn't really specific about what I would do. It was more about how it would feel to be me. And at that time, I wasn't really thriving in my career. I could see now it's because the job I was doing had no resonance with my personal values at all. I was really just doing it for the money. And so I was finding that quite damaging to my self-esteem. And so for me, the things that I really wanted out of life were to feel happy, to have healthy self-esteem, to feel purposeful and fulfilled. And for me, that involved living life, I want to say courageously, really getting out there and just squeezing every last drop of enjoyment out of life rather than being hemmed in by all these rather limiting beliefs about... Um, oh, I'll be happy when I've got the bigger house or I'll be happy when I get the promotion and the pay rise. It was really about just being happy in the moment and uh, really living life wholeheartedly. And then the, the obituary that I was actually heading for if I carried on as I was, was very conventional, very safe, very secure. But the way that I felt when I was writing that more realistic obituary compared with my fantasy obituary... <sighs> It, there was just no comparison. I realized that I, if I carried on as I was, I was really going to end up feeling rather disappointed with the way that I'd lived my life. And I didn't want to get to my deathbed and be full of regrets about the way that I'd spent my time on earth. So I, I wish I could say that I made the changes immediately. It took quite a while because it was actually terrifying to face this very different version of my future. But I think once you've had that glimpse, I mean, I was so excited when I was writing that fantasy obituary. It was almost like I'd had a, a glimpse into a parallel universe where I was living the life that I was supposed to be living. And it's one of those things that once you know it, you can't pretend that you, you don't know it. You can't put it back in the box. Exactly. So t to unleash that, you said about rowing the Atlantic. Mm. Yeah. Well, there was, a, um, there was a few years in between the obituary exercise. I had to, uh, <laughs> I suppose, extricate myself from this sensible, in quotes, grown up lifestyle that I was living. So yes, I, I quit my job and um, also quit my significant relationship. And um, yeah, set about reinventing myself from the ground up. And it was at around that time, via the Environmental Awakening, that I decided to take on this enormous challenge, sort of 50% inspired by my desire to explore my own limits and 50% um, as my platform to raise environmental awareness. And somehow rowing solo across oceans seemed to tick all the boxes. So a, cu a couple of facts to throw in here. The Atlantic row was... 2,935 miles. It took you about a million oar strokes and you were alone at sea for 103 days, five hours and 43 minutes. And along the way, you consumed 462 energy bars. <laughs> <laughs> and I broke practically every you, piece of equipment on board. <laughs> so um, let's, let's go to um, the moment where you're leaving the Canary Islands you're faced with, you know, in excess of 
around 100 days at sea. What in the world is going through your head at that point where you're pulling out in the first few, I don't know, the first 1,000 oar strokes, you're pulling away from the shore, you're going it alone. Whatever is going through your head at that point? Well, I didn't get off to a flying start. <laughs> uh, so by this point, I'd spent 14 months getting ready for this, just absolutely flat out trying to raise the money, buy the boat, get the boat all kitted out and fitted out to all of these training courses in meteorology and celestial navigation and um, marine radio communications, all of these things. Um, and so finally, <laughs> the, the great thing about being so busy in the 14 months r leading up to the start of the row was I didn't really have time to think about it too much, this enormous challenge that I was taking on. So there was a bit of a... Um, yikes moment um sorry I'm, I'm i'm trying to keep my language clean here um more or less yikes as i'm setting out from the dock in the canaries um that row i did actually do as part of a race the other ones i was just completely solo but this one i was the only solo woman in the atlantic rowing race that year and um <laughs> what was going through my mind was yikes everybody else has set off already and the race hasn't even started and I'm I'm already losing um and then that first day I had problems with the water maker which luckily I did manage to resolve and um after about six hours at sea I was being horrendously seasick so uh, most of my thoughts on that first day are pretty unrepeatable um I was just thinking oh my word what have I let myself in for and it does feel deeply unnatural to be rowing away from land and out into the big blue ocean. And because rowers face backwards and we're pulling on the oars, you can actually see land just receding into the distance and disappearing over the horizon. And it's, um, it's a very strange feeling. Um, I think even after the amount of time I spent at sea, I'm still naturally a landlubber because <laughs> the ocean is a big, scary place. There's a good reason that most of us live on dry land. So um, I was at that point definitely faking it. I was <laughs> pretending to be this intrepid ocean rower and really not, not feeling it. And so I imagine a fair degree of self-doubt kicks in. Oh, a huge amount, yes. And um, I remember in the book you mentioned uh, numerous times to the press before you left that you wanted to get outside your comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that joke ended up being on me. Um, yes, yeah, something that just really bugged me so much and um, well, actually throughout the entire row was why is this so uncomfortable? Uh, I got tendonitis in my shoulders very early on, had these salt water sores on my bottom. Um, the rowing seat just felt so uncomfortable. Um, my sleeping bag got wet, so that was all uncomfortable as well. And, and yes, as you say, one day I, I'm rowing along and just got this my thoughts are just going in this non-stop loop about uncomfortable and and suddenly the penny dropped and I recalled that in the run-up to the row as you say um whenever I was asked why I was doing this I'd say it's because I want to get outside my comfort zone and I suddenly realized that by definition getting outside your comfort zone is going to be duh um uncomfortable and so in a way that really helps me because look, flipping that around and looking at it that way made me realise that the discomfort meant I was actually succeeding in what I'd set out to do, that the discomfort was a necessary part of it. Um, but yes, I should be more careful what I, what I wish for. <laughs> and so this actually links to the comment you, you made just now, which is that when you're out at sea, you don't have any landmarks. Mm. So how do you kind of recognise progress when you're out there? Well, you have a GPS. So at the end of each rowing shift, I would come back into the cabin and I would fill out another line in my log book. So I'd make a note of my latitude and longitude and wind conditions and how my batteries were charging from the solar panels and um, various other parameters like how much I'd eaten, whether I'd had any sleep, how many hours of rowing I'd done. Um, so that's really how I kept track of my, my progress. But, um, 
in many ways it felt um it felt very monotonous it was kind of like a cross between groundhog day and the truman show um it just felt like i was uh <laughs> it's ironic that one of my goals in going out there was because I, I wanted to get a sense of how big the world is. But really, I could just have been <laughs> rowing like on a, you know, one of those um, like swimming pools where they have the, the flow of water so that you can um, you get that sense of the, the resistance. It, uh, it was really only the weather conditions that changed. Apart from that, it was just me and my little boat and... Um, the ocean and the sky day after day after day and so um when after 103 days when you you get to antigua what's mm. the first thing you want to do <laughs> have a shower <laughs> <laughs> well no, actually the first thing i wanted to do uh, was hug my mum um my dad had died the year before i set out on the atlantic and um, as you can imagine my mum was somewhat less than thrilled when i announced that i was going to do this rather ridiculous and unprecedented thing of rowing solo across oceans. Um, but when she saw how much determination I was bringing to this, she decided that if you can't beat them, you may as well join them. And she'd ended up being the most wonderful and trusted um, member of my team, the shoulder to cry on or the sympathetic ear. And she never once said, well, I could have told you it was a ridiculous idea. And we'd... Um, before my satellite phone broke, which was 24 days before the end, we'd spoken just about every day. And um, she kept promising me this big hug when I got to Antigua. So that was definitely number one priority when I set foot ashore. But then shortly after that, a cold beer and a hot shower were very nice indeed. How do, how do you feel when the radio dies on you? Because presumably at that point it's pretty clear that you're on your own. But then when the radio goes, is that psychologically really difficult to deal with? Actually, uh, oh, strictly speaking, it's the phone, not the radio. The oh, marine sorry, radio sorry. is still working. Sorry, just in case there are any ocean rowers listening to this podcast. Um, it was funny, actually, because when the phone broke, it almost felt perfect <laughs> you know I'd, I'd been so frustrated that I'd been out there for so long initially I'd hoped to get across in less than 56 days which was the women's record at that time probably still is and um I kept thinking you know why am I still stuck out here you know what is it that I'm supposed to learn I was of this mindset that everything happens for a reason and I just couldn't figure out what the reason was and when the phone broke it was like well, I guess I wanted to find out what I'm capable of, how self-reliant I can be. And so, yeah, it makes perfect sense that my phone is now broken. So I was actually quite excited about it. In a way, it did fundamentally change the way that I felt about my experience out there because up until that point, I was getting weather forecasts through my phone. And if it was a good forecast, I'd get really excited. And if it was a a bad forecast, I get really anxious about the upcoming storm or high winds. And so when the phone broke, that source of information was just cut off. And you know what it's like with weather forecasts, they're wrong most of the time anyway. But meanwhile, I'd been putting myself on this real emotional roller coaster. So when the phone broke, I became much more present in the moment, I stopped worrying about the future. And it was such a relief. It's like, well, I have no idea what's going to happen next. I'm just going to have to take it as it comes and cope with whatever Mother Nature chooses to dole out to me. And I <laughs> I think there's a real lesson there because even now I often find myself worrying far too much about the future and usually worrying about things that don't happen anyway. And so I think we, we often do get ourselves caught up in our imagined dramas and when we can just be really present in the moment and just have the confidence that we can deal with whatever happens, it's such a relief. So I was I was actually really happy that the phone broke. I think in this day and age, it's a real privilege to be able to quite literally step off the earth for a while and have no communications. The only thing that really concerned me was that I knew that my mum would be 
very worried. She could still see from the transponder where I was, but I'm sure that sometimes in the small hours of the night she was very concerned. But yeah, for me it was um it was a blessing actually. It's amazing. It sounded like it was just what you needed. Exactly. I certainly wouldn't have planned it. I wouldn't have deliberately put my mum through that. But I still feel very lucky to have had that experience. And then once you uh, found out what you were made of by rowing the Atlantic solo, you then, a, a few years later, set about taking on the Pacific. Yeah, I'd actually, right from the start, I'd planned to do the three oceans, but I didn't announce all of that up front because I thought, might be a good idea to do one and see how that one goes. And actually, I felt like I'd made so many mistakes on the Atlantic, um, especially sort of psychological mistakes. I definitely made life harder for myself than it needed to be, just because I wasn't really managing my thought processes very well. And I had learned a lot as I was going along, but it was such a steep learning curve that I felt like I hadn't really had time to fully absorb all of the lessons that I was learning. So yeah, the intention was very much to uh, really um, internalize those lessons and then to put myself back out into a testing environment again and see if I could do it better the next time around. So um, I finished doing the Atlantic in March 2006 and in August 2007, I set out to try and row the Pacific. Unfortunately, that first attempt didn't go very well. Ended up um, with a a rather ignominious rescue um, after about 10 days. Um, So I had to then wait another year before I could get out again. Um, But yes, I took on the Pacific, which was going to be 8,000 miles versus a mere 3,000 miles that the Atlantic had been. And so before we talk about the other legs of the Pacific, you mentioned there about the psychological lessons that you learned from the Atlantic. What what do you think are the most important uh, lessons there that you can share? Um, oh, there were so many. Um, certainly that one about just taking it one day at a time. Um, was really fundamental um, because at the start of that Atlantic row, I looked at the whole 3,000 miles ahead of me and got really overwhelmed by that. So um, I learned the hard way that I needed to break it down into much smaller chunks, like one day or the next three-hour rowing shift. Or, or sometimes I found that if I was having real slump in energy, if I could force myself just to do another 10 oar strokes, then I'd somehow come out of the other side of the slump and could keep on going. So it was really um, just breaking it down into smallest chunks that, um, that I needed to. Something else um, really important was um, not to get too caught up in my own emotional drama. I uh, because my stereo broke very early on in that voyage so I really was just alone with my own thoughts for three and a half months which is quite a brutal experience I often found myself going into quite negative places being self-critical self-doubtful um, getting very impatient and hence very frustrated with my slow rate of progress and um I did get better and better at catching myself as I was going down that mental spiral, sort of down the plug hole (laughs) and kind of going, you know, let's, if we can't think something nice, then let's just try not to think anything at all for a few moments. And even to sort of step outside of myself, to imagine myself in the the pub, like after this was all over, telling my salty old sea stories or the talks that I would give or how I would describe this in the book to almost think about myself in the third person and be telling my own story so that I disengaged from all of those negative emotions that I was going through and instead tried to sort of become the hero of my own story, even if I wasn't feeling at all heroic at the time, which I normally wasn't. Um, Because I think sometimes we do get caught up in our own intense emotional drama. And if we can try and be a bit sort of zen and get that uh, Buddhist detachment from what's going on in the moment, it it can um, really help us to see the bigger picture 
and know that in the future we're going to be really proud that we had the perseverance to hang on in there and just keep on going yeah no that's a valuable insight i think um so just <clears throat> reverting back to the pacific row yeah so basically you broke it down into three legs um so the first one was going from san francisco to hawaii which was 2324 miles that took over a million oar strokes nearly 100 days alone at sea and uh Along the way, you mentioned that you consumed or read 62 audiobooks. <laughs> yeah, oh, audiobooks just changed my world. Um, but it, it made it so much easier. It was almost like I was cheating. Um, and I'm really glad that on the Atlantic, I'd had that experience of just being left alone with my own thoughts. I wouldn't have chosen it voluntarily because it was incredibly hard, but... Looking back on it now, I can see that it was one of the most formative and character building experiences of my life. But yes, after that, I decided that I'd probably had more than enough me time than is healthy in any one lifetime, um, unless you are a Buddhist monk. Um, and so, yeah, the audiobooks just made the time pass so much more quickly. And then the next leg looked like it's the longest leg of over 3,000 miles. It took one point, well, over 1.3 million oar strokes mm. and over 104 days at sea to go. That was from Hawaii to the island of Kiribati. And then the how soon after did you do the final leg? Um, those three stages of the Pacific, I did one per year for th uh, in 2008, 9 and 10. Um, yeah, that added up to a total of 250 days at sea. Um, one of the real challenges there was the heat because I was going across the equator. And uh, yeah, my dad had ginger hair. I'm very English complexioned. I just don't do well in the tropics. And I had this horrible itchy heat rash for about two months that just drove me crazy. I just wanted to scratch it, but that didn't help. And yeah, it was just sweltering, especially going through the doldrums where the wind just drops away to nothing. So you're going slower anyway without that wind assistance. And also you're just boiling. So that was, um, that was quite hard work. And also at the same time, you get these really weird little currents and eddies around the equator that can really send you 60 miles in the wrong direction. So my patience was tested as never before on that crossing. And you had the um, added uncertainty of cargo ships. Yeah, actually, um, <laughs> it really varies. Coming out of San Francisco, I saw a lot of container ships because um, it's a very busy port there. But then once I got further out to sea, you really see fewer and fewer ships. And in fact, that middle stage of the Pacific, in 104 days, I only saw one ship. And that was um, a cruise liner. And that was on the day that I crossed the equator. And um, I think they were having their own parties on board because they didn't seem to be moving very much. They were just sort of hanging out there at zero degrees latitude. And um, I tried to hail them on the radio, actually, but I think they were too busy partying to pick up the call. But then coming into Papua New Guinea at the end, on the final stage of that Pacific crossing, it was quite nerve wracking because there were times when I could see five container ships at a time and we were all going through quite a narrow channel heading into Madang. So uh, that's not a particularly happy experience because I'm in this tiny boat and I probably wouldn't even show up on their radar because of the, you know, the waves create interference. I just wouldn't really stand out from all of that. So I was quite worried about being run over. But thank heavens I'm still here. It's understandable. Yeah, thank goodness. And so the last leg is 2,248 miles and took about half a million oar strokes, 46 days. So And then soon after that, you rode the Indian Ocean. And so I was interested to know, is there any one that stands out as being the hardest? Oh, I, I would say the Atlantic for sure was the hardest um, for multiple reasons. One was because it was my first and I was learning so much as I went along. I would thought I was really well prepared, but um, I think, you know, the first time that you do anything new is going to be the hardest. Um, 
also because the stereo broke. So I was just there with my own thoughts. Also because I was in a race and didn't want to be in a race. It definitely took the pressure off on the later ones when I was just out there doing my own thing. Um, Having said that, none of them were easy. I was really surprised on the Indian Ocean. That was my longest single voyage. That was 154 days, five months to the day. Um, And um, it was rough. I capsized a lot on that ocean. And that's quite scary. Even when you trust your boat, you know it's going to pop the right way up because it's designed to do that. It's still just not fun capsizing. So um, I was surprised even with my much stronger psychological skills by that stage, I still found that one tough, tough going. So, yeah, I don't think rowing across oceans is ever easy. Um, But, uh, you know, that might say a lot about, you know, my internal dialogue. I know some people who've had a lot of fun out there. Um, There was one crew in the Great Pacific Race a couple of years ago, these four guys, and they just seemed to laugh and joke their whole way from Monterey to Hawaii. But um, my experience has always been a bit, you know, a bit harder than that. I don't know if it's the going so low or if it's just the way that I'm wired, but um, it's always been testing. This might seem like a silly question, but is, is rowing the Atlantic the hardest thing you've ever done, do you think? Um, I would say yes, it it was. Um, there are some tough decisions that I've had to make in my life. I really, when I decided to rip up my old life and start again, um, that was that was very nerve wracking. Um, not knowing where my income was going to come from, there were some very acute moments where it came to crunch time and I had to make really big decisions and that was hard um which is a different kind of hard than rowing across an ocean which is three and a half months of hardship um but of course you know it's I'd chosen to be out there on the Atlantic so even when I was having my worst days I had to remind myself that you chose to be here. So you've really abdicated all rights to whinge about this, which didn't stop me from whinging. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And it might sound weird, but I hope that the Atlantic isn't the hardest thing that I do in my whole life. I hope that I have future challenges ahead that um, that I find hard. Because, you know, if, if you're not doing things that you find hard, you're you're getting soft and squishy. You're not pushing yourself hard enough. And I I want to, I think, keep on getting outside of my comfort zone and to do things that that I've never done before and things that might, again, make me full of self-doubt and yikes, and can I do this? Um, Because I feel like I've learned a lot about how to tackle big challenges and I want to put that to good use. And I, I don't know yet what exactly what use that's going to be. But I feel like I'm open to life giving me that call. So there's nothing specific you've got your eye on as a target? Um, I've got some things coming down the pipeline. They're not massively outside of my comfort zone. Um, this summer, I'm going to be writing a book about courage. Um as someone who went from being completely not courageous to <laughs> at least being able to give the appearance of something resembling courage. Um, that's a concept that I'm really interested to explore. And um, I may be also pursuing some academic challenges. I've looked at other things as well. I looked at getting into politics at, at one point uh, as something suitably scary, Um But after doing quite a bit of research into that, I really felt there wasn't anything about politics that I would enjoy. Even though I still want to create change in the world, I'm not sure that that's going to be my path to do it. But something like that, and I'll know it when I see it. Okay. Um, So following all these extreme scenarios that you've put yourself in, Mm. um, can you sort of share with us how you react when things go badly and how you react when things go well? And is there a difference now you've done this incredible rowing? That's um, a really great expedition. question. Um, 
it's been interesting this year going through the 10th anniversary of my arrival into Antigua because there were so many things that went wrong on that voyage, like all four of my oars breaking, the phone breaking, my camping stove breaking, so I had to eat all my freeze-dried food cold. Um, so many things got lost or broken on that voyage. And at the time, I was like, oh, you know, everything's going wrong and why is why is this so awful? Why is why is the ocean being so mean to me? And yet now I look back on those, in quotes, bad things. And I know I wouldn't have learned anywhere near as much about myself and about how to deal with big challenges if everything had gone smoothly. So in a weird way, bad things are good things. If you learn from them. Yeah. So I try not to attach labels like good and bad <laughs> to things it's more a case of all information is feedback so if I try something and it doesn't go the way I wanted it to it's like mm, okay so I got a result and it wasn't the result that I thought I wanted so how do I do this differently the next time to get a different result that's hopefully closer to what I wanted so that's the um, the attitude that I try to to take now and that's um you know, I think sometimes we, we really judge the things that happen to us or we judge the people that happen to us. And a phrase that I heard earlier this year that really resonated with me was, how about if rather than feeling that things happen to you, how about if you look at it as things happening for you? So it's like, how can I take this and use it as, you know, grist to my mill um, to to improve the way that I show up in the world. So, um, kind of a link to this, do you feel that you're perhaps more grateful? Is gratitude something you think about a lot more now than before? Is yeah, that- I think that gratitude is one of those fundamental practices that can really change your outlook on the world. And I, I love this sort of growing field of positive psychology. And, and I think that keeping a gratitude journal or even just at the end of each day thinking about what <laughs> what good things happen or or just what things happen and it could be well I learned something from a painful experience but that can be the thing that I'm grateful for so um in fact in a way I even did this practice while I was on the ocean because I was blogging every day and I would write the blog at the end of the day And it was very helpful because often that last rowing shift, the last three hours going into darkness, it would be quite a tough rowing shift because you're tired and you really just want to go to bed and then you've got to go and do this blog. Um, But it would help me get a perspective on the day and help me to think about, oh, yeah, there was a really gorgeous sunrise this morning. Or, oh, I had one of those little aha moments that somehow made the day a bit better. And it helped me to yeah pick out the little the gems and get a a more balanced perspective on how the day had gone and do you think you're lucky I do actually (laughs) I'm never lucky in like games of luck or still haven't won the lottery I'm not lucky in that kind of a thing but even my mum said to me the other day she said oh you just you always land on your feet and I feel like I do um And what I take away from that is I think fortune really does favour the bold because a lot of my luck comes in the form of wonderful people coming into my life. And when I was doing the rowing, I sometimes feel like a bit of a fraud describing myself as a solo rower because over the years, literally thousands of people have helped me in terms of sponsoring a mile or sending encouraging messages or... Um, coming and helping out with boat renovations or, you know, in so many ways people have have helped. And I think when, you, when you're out there doing something out of the ordinary and you're humble enough to ask for help because you know you can't do it all on your own, it creates this sort of wonderful energy vortex that people just show up. And uh, I'm just, in my mind's eye, just flicking through images of some of the real stars like these people who've shown up and helped me out over the years 
and it's it's wonderfully life affirming to feel that sense of shared purpose and connection with people who are just excited about what you're doing so um this is a slightly unfair question but are, are you able to sort of describe the mindset you adopt that is a great question um <laughs> and also i'm thinking the mindset that i really adopt or the mindset i wish i adopted because <laughs> you know I, I i'm not always my my best self but you know i don't think any of us are and we have to be a little bit forgiving let's let's say in the good times in the good moments i think i'm i'm generally quite reflective and i do have this fundamental trust that life will look after me but I feel like it's a sort of a dance between me and life. I, I have to show up and do my bit and show willing and put myself out there to kind of be um, willing to sort of surrender to, oh, without wanting to sound too pious about it, but kind of like a purpose that's bigger than me. Um, and so, you know, for a long time, that's been uh, my environmental calling. But I think there are many many different callings and it's really that sense of wanting to leave the world a better place than I found it and there are many different ways that that people can achieve that and I think that we all have something unique to do in this lifetime and I'm always trying to sort of refine mine to get closer to that unique path that I have and it's still very much a work in progress Um, I know it's something about inspiring people to follow their path. I know it's using my ability with words, the spoken word and the written word, to um, share a message with people. But uh, it is a process of constant refinement. And I think no sooner, you know, for seven years, my calling was to row solo across oceans. And that was a vision that I had that came true. And it was very much connected with that obituary exercise. Um, and so now, you know, I need to find the, the next big thing, but always try to think big and not in an egotistical or self-aggrandizing way, but just to recognize that I'm not going to serve my purpose in the world well by playing small. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I thought one of the most fascinating points in the book was uh, particularly the first book, uh, Rowing the Atlantic, was where you say that, um, you know, we we have the option to reframe our circumstances and you talk about controlling your inner dialogue and then choosing how we respond to situations. Um, and I thought that was particularly interesting. And um, I wondered if you thought, is, is that something that uh, anyone can get hold of and apply? Definitely. I, I really do more and more feel that we create our world from the inside out, that the way we show up in the world and the expectations that we have kind of, um, in a way, project themselves and, and create our, our future. I think it was George Bernard Shaw who said something like, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so I think we have far more power and influence over our lives than we often allow ourselves to have. We we can feel like we're a victim of circumstance or people are mean to us, but I think we can really influence that by the way, not even so much the things that we do, but just the way that we are. I'm a real believer in, uh, sorry, I love my quotes, uh, but, but you know, Gandhi saying, be the change that you want to see in the world. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to ask you uh, a few, perhaps slightly shorter questions. Mm. Um, one is, what motivates you? Oh, uh, really just trying to be my best self, to be better today than I was yesterday. What has been your biggest mistake? <laughs> oh, it's funny, I don't really think in those terms. Um, you know, I don't think I even want to answer that because... Sure, I've made mistakes, but I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't made those mistakes, and I'm quite happy with where I am now. So I I don't know which of those threads I could pull out without the whole fabric of my life unravelling, so i better just keep it all mistakes and everything. They're golden. (laughs) Yes. What would you say to your 18-year-old self? (laughs) Don't take life so 
damn seriously. You know, I, was, uh, I still have a tendency to be rather earnest and serious about life. And I think when you start treating it as fun and a game and be willing to make mistakes and be willing to screw up at things and, you know, just pick yourself up again and carry on. Um, I think that is incredibly empowering. For a long time, I was crippled by fear of failure. And when you have a few really big failures and you realise that life goes on, it's incredibly liberating. The penultimate question I want to ask is, um, of all the audio books you listen to along the way, which one keeps you going? Which one stands out? (laughs) <laughs> this is not going to be a deep and meaningful answer. I absolutely loved George R. R. Martin's Songs of Ice and Fire, uh, which is now dramatised as Game of Thrones. Brilliant. That got me you through. You were ahead of the game there. I, I was, and, and they were brilliant. So these massive books. So one book would last me about four days, and um, I always looked forward to the next Tyrion chapter. Just absolute devotee of um, those books and, and that dramatisation. Fabulous. Perfect perfect way to end it thank you very much (laughs) it's been a real pleasure thanks toby thank you